Good morning. Uh, this probably looks a little bit complicated. Welcome to Frank's school, incidentally. Uh, today and then I think tomorrow will be probably the last day. I'm dealing with the trades from my perspective. 88th day of the fourth year, the first semester, as I think of it, is almost over. Um, now, this all looks so complicated. These are playlists, and what I'm about to try to explain uh, today is how this all affects my politics. I'm, I'm going to get political. I did that last year. It sort of surprised me in a way because I didn't know exactly that I would, but I finally, last year, decided uh, I need to do that. Uh, I need to sh show my viewers, be open with my viewers, and show them what I think about some stuff. Uh, and in the process last year, uh, I put on, uh, well, th these sort of go together. Th these all kind of go together. They, they apply to this. Let me start at the top. These are playlists. So if you go to my channel, click on playlists, there's the list. The perspective, the prospectus is the one I'm actually still working on, but I've set it up as a playlist. This will be part of the prospectus. The prospectus for a uh, Handwerker's Hof, uh, a craftsman's village, what I'm doing here on the farm. And by the way, I, I forgot that I really should allow for a place for a quarryman and a miner, uh, uh, something about that, because the two are just too important here. Uh, now, there, there, if for those of you that, that were watch that, and I walk around the farm and I show stuff, and I talk about the history, well, there's another playlist, The Forgotten Village, which is very archaeological, where in detail I show the archaeological evidence that I know of on the ground. Uh, Frank's books, well, uh, just like I flipped through books about the trades, earlier I flipped through books that I have on various subjects uh, that pertain. Uh, the Decentralist Manifesto, well, to get these in order, I, I did Wedge's Paradigm first and uh, put it in context. Uh, but the Decentralist Manifesto was really part of that. These came out of an effort I made uh, to, to uh, begin an enormous book called The Homestead Engineer's Handbook, along with Gary Fitz. He and I worked on that, but eventually stopped. So anyway, uh, they're there. Uh, and uh, you can take a look if you want. I'm going to refer to this one in just a second. But now another thing, uh, I wanted to mention this. Uh, it, seem, uh, it seems to me that there's a different kind of memory besides history. History writes events down and you can open a book and you can read what happened. But I've noticed before that there seems to be a different kind of a memory. I, I'm calling it the craftsman's memory and legacy. Uh, uh, for in my case, for example, I may start as a craftsman, as a builder, I may start a project and not be able to get back to it for 20 years. There's ever, I, I've run into that now because now I have time. But when I go back to the place I was working, I understand what I was doing. It's like the material tells me, here's where you were. This is what you were doing. And very often, I've left the things there ready for me 20 years later or, or tomorrow or whatever there to pick it up. And it, it sort of has, it, it's a way of recording in a sense. I, I don't know if I, I've never tried to explain this. And when I say legacy, well, for example, I'm going to go to Portugal again in, in, uh, in May. And one of the reasons I'm going there is to see the legacy of the craftsmen, what the craftsmen have done. A stone wall on a mountainside. I'm going to be looking at terraces on mountainsides. And I mean, that's just stones laid up in, in stone walls. But it's a legacy, and it speaks to me in a way. I mean, I, the hands of the craftsman and how he set that stone, I can't explain it very well. But I thought, you know, I'm going to give that a shot. Because, uh, well, uh, still another example. My neighbor, his name is Andy, uh, that works with me all the time. Uh, he took a motor apart, and he left all the pieces there, and then he went away for a week because he uh, didn't have the parts or whatever. And uh, when he came back, well, he knew what he was doing. He left, he, he said at the time, I think I can put all this, I hope I can put all this back together. Now he's begun to take his 
little camera, cell phone camera, and take pictures of things so he can see how to put them back together. Pretty smart, but too high tech for me. But he left everything there and then put it back together. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> all right, now political. Oh boy. Yeah, you know, politics. What do they say? There's two things you should never talk about religion and politics. Well, here I go. Um, I think, uh, well, in the Decentralist Manifesto, at the end of the first paragraph of the Decentralist Manifesto, I explained that my approach as a Decentralist was, I felt like if you're in a, in a room with a lot of massive pillars, like a Gothic cathedral or something, and you're looking, well, you see things, the, the pillars hide things. But then if you move a little bit to the side, I can do it actually with the post that I'm looking at right now. You move to the side, you see things that are different. And, and things can look very differently. That's what I did here. Imagine that these are six or yeah, 16 craftsmen. Uh, and, uh, and what I am doing, I think, is looking, you might call it across the grain. Uh, the guilds, for example, they tended to look this way. Here's a, these are blacksmiths, all right, blacksmiths. There's four blacksmiths. Uh, uh, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, there we go four butchers. Well, the blacksmiths form a guild for the good of the blacksmiths to protect their interest. Uh, so you've kind of got this arrangement. And uh, they, they in the cities, I found out, that's, that's always kind of amazed me, that cities tend to have a, a section of the city that has all the one particular, tra all the cloth merchants together in one section of the city. I first noticed that, I think, in Recife, Brazil. Uh, so they make a guild or maybe a, a trade union, electricians, in, in a more modern sense. Well, oh, and I, and these, I, I have suspected that all of these end up getting linked together uh, because it is to their benefit to have everybody do things the same because that way they can be assured of a high level, uh, high level of quality. Uh, the insurance companies are comfortable insuring then, and the banks will loan the money because it's insured. But And code uh, forces it to be uh, the same, a and presumably good. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, get, I could launch into this because in, a, in terms of building, if you want to build a building differently from code, possibly better. Well, you're allowed. It, it can be too code or better. You're allowed to do it, build it better. But who says it's better? Then you've got to go to an architect, or he maybe has to go to a structural engineer. And it's just completely out of the layman's uh, uh, realm. <laughs> so what do you do? You, so, sort of like me, you become an outlaw, and what do they say, ask, ask forgiveness. Instead of asking permission, ask forgiveness. Uh, well, anyway, uh, you know, guilds, I had thought, oh, guilds, that's sweet, that's nice, a group of craftsmen. I had I changed my mind when I started to read about this. I changed my mind because I thought, no, no, guilds. That was the beginning of that centralization, that 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 getting control. Uh, and and you know I have America written down here because the American experience was different when those settlers came to America. So many of them had the name Zimmerman. For, for example, there were Zimmermans or Zimmers or that, that, that lived here. Well, they were carpenters. But here, there was no guild. Uh, and in a sense, you know, America has this reputation of being free. And once uh, I remember talking to a German man years ago, and he scoffed at that. He said, ah, you can't, you're not even allowed to smoke in a restaurant. How do you call that free? Uh, and I knew what he meant. I mean, Americans pride them some, some, themselves so much in their freedom. But there's a way where I could see that starting. Because with the craftsmen, there was no guild. And, and not at first. Well, in a sense, there never really was. Uh, eventually, there were trade unions. And so they sprung free. Uh, in a sense, we got the outlaws of the tradesmen because they, you know, they if, if they'd been doing real well, they would have stayed in Europe and been part of the guild. But I think that comes right down to today. You know, I know quite a few Germans, and, and, and I praised Germany yesterday with their attitude toward the trades. But I think Germans also very much have this attitude. 
you know, Americans, I think, in a sense, are almost scary because they, they don't play by the book. Uh, or, or I don't. <laughs> anyway. Well, anyway, if you, uh, and so what's the government's role in this? Before long, the, oh, it was interesting when I d did some reading and studying about this to see how the guilds and the government became almost the same, and yet sometimes they fought and became a real big problem. Well, the government has to make this all work. Uh, and, and now what I'm saying is I, I'm looking across the grain in a sense. Uh, I, so if you look this way, you see four blacksmiths and four uh, butchers, uh, and they form a guild from your viewpoint. If there's where you look, basically that's what you see. But if you look from here and you look this way, now you see a, a, a collection of four different craftsmen, a blacksmith, a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker. And then here's another collection, uh, a blacksmith, a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker. Well, in a sense, each one of these is a potential village. And you know, I've even come, this is scary, but I've even come across the word sell. That, that uh, term is so much in the news right now because they, they talk about terrorist cells terrorist cells. Well, in a sense, this is a decentralist cell. I mean, you can't have a village with nothing but blacksmiths. You've got to have all these trades. But you could have a village with only one blacksmith. You know, I, I'm getting pretty political here. Well, how I sort of came across all this was because I got studying Nuremberg. That's what started me on uh, the, uh, the, the Stendenbuch. Since that was done in Nuremberg, I thought, wow, Nuremberg must have been so cool back in 1500 to have all these little shops. And then I began to hit some amazing history. There was a Handwerker Aufstand, a, a craftsman's uprising in Nuremberg that got squashed. And, and I thought the craftsmen rose up in revolt and the politics were so complicated there. And there were guilds. This was stuff I had not anticipated. I, I, I said this wrong, actually, to my friend Shirley, and I thought it was Han Werkers, uh, like they own the Aufstand, and I came up with Han Werkers Aufstand, which I guess is pretty funny in German, because I think that means drunk, uh, I think, if she explained it to me right. Well, anyway, that led me to then look at peasant revolts in general. And if you would Google that, peasant revolts, boy, I, I mean, I'm going to go back and I'm going to study that. Because there have been times when the simple people just got, they couldn't take it anymore. And they rose up against the governments. Uh, and the governments usually were bound. I mean, when you look at the peasant revolts, they virtually all failed. One or two had a little bit of an effect, but it's alarming. I mean, so many times it's happened, they've all failed. Uh, I never saw a peasant boycott, though. A craftsman's boycott. I, you know, I thought a handwerker's boycott. Uh, just stop buying that stuff. That's sort of different. I'm, I won't go into that. That would be maybe getting too political at the moment. But if you want to see me really let loose, at the end of the uh, decentralist manifesto, I think that, that, that's where I think I say, so what do you do? Well, this is political. There was a Deutscher Bauerkrieg, a German uh, farmer's war that got squashed. There's an enormous one in, in England. I can't think of the name of it right now. And the first time I'd actually run into this situation was in Luzerne. The countryside around the Swiss city of Luzerne rose up or fought a war against the city of Lucerne. That's just so, so different, that, that, that thinking. Uh, I found out about that because I, uh, the guy who who was the peacemaker that came in and stopped it all was Bruder Klaus, and I, I went to his cell <laughs> where he lived, because it's been like a holy place. The Pope himself went there to visit it once. Uh, all right, and then this sounds so revolutionary. What about Marx? Isn't he the one that said, workers of the world unite? The Communist Manifesto. The Communist Manifesto, workers of the world unite. Well, that's, I don't think that's what I'm saying. Huh, I don't think. In communism, because that's too much about the government. But a guild, and there are some in the United States, there's the American Craftsmen's Council, 
and I think there's a Pennsylvania Craftsman's Guild, I think there is. Anyway, they tend to be more like this, a guild representing the different craftsmen, not just the blacksmith, not just the butchers, but the different craftsmen. But I have been uh, disappointed every time I've run into that because it seemed to me that they still had this business, that they were going to jury the, uh, uh, the product of the craftsmen and say what's good and what's bad. Uh, well, I'd probably better stop. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, uh, I have one more day, uh, and I'm going to, uh, tomorrow, or well, uh, giving myself one more day, Tomo uh, tomorrow I think it is, I'm going to go through three sonnets that I wrote that I think of as the craftsman sonnets, where I deal s sort of with this stuff. All right, I don't know what you thought about this, but uh, when I get political, I get going. Bye for now.